Okay, so I'm Roland McDevitt. I'm the Division Chief for Paddlecraft Safety. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about vessel safety checks for paddlecraft, and it's kind of our practice run. We're going to be doing a bunch of these and uh, hopefully doing a very similar session down at the National Conference in Orlando in August. Uh, presenting with me tonight is uh, Joy Tagooting from Alexandria, Virginia, and Don Rice from Naples, Florida. And uh, Joey's going to start us off. So, Joey, do you want to want to get us started? Sure. Uh, let's let's get the show on the road here. Uh, good evening, folks. Uh, I'm Joey T. Um, we've divided the presentation into three uh, segments. I'll be taking the first section, which generally breaks down to some of the legal requirements for uh, paddle craft. Uh, the, the the middle section, uh, Don Rice will pick up and talk a little bit about the more of the technical aspects of the paddle craft and the and the vessels themselves. Uh, then uh, Roland will follow up the last segment with more about the human 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 side of paddle uh, craft and uh, uh, kayaking and stand up paddling and more of the behaviors uh, 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 for this presentation. So as you can see on the first screen, um, we've got Don Rice there doing a, 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 a class for a bunch of vessel examiners, which is great. Um, and and we'll, we'll talk more about why we're doing for vessel examiners, but that's what this whole topic is tonight is uh, vessel safety checks uh, for pa specifically for paddle craft. Let's do this. Um, this slide right here, uh, earlier or late, earlier last year, I think Robin Pope, um, our deputy director in recreational boating uh, safety outreach did a, um, uh, uh, an assessment evaluation for uh, recreational boating fatalities, uh, uh, trends and evidence-based um, interventions. And from that um, uh, study, I pulled um, some of the slides that you see on the, on the screen at the moment. Uh, upper left-hand corner, uh, you can take into account now that nearly five, uh, two in, in every five boaters are, are paddlers, which is, is, is a big number if you, if you start uh, thinking about it. Uh, because I think some of the estimates predict that uh, we're, we're close to 40% or uh, close to 40% of recreational of recreational boating, uh, which is which is a significant number. And you can see the participation numbers on that left hand corner. Um, and um, what we'll talk about some of the reasons for uh, doing vessel safety checks is, as it says in the in that upper left hand corner, uh, drowning is is a is one of the is the most common cause of, of fatalities, and that the efforts that uh, life jackets actually do save lives. So wearing it is 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 the proper thing to do. On the upper right hand corner, uh, you can see that participation in canoeing, in kayaking, stand up paddle boarding, all these paddle uh, paddle sports is is increasing. Is is increasing and moving. Um, Upwards, um, some of the estimates uh, have predicted that um, it's uh, the participation in paddle sports is close to about a million paddlers every year. Um, and, and I'll say this real quick: um, last year, I went I went down to the American Canoe Association and picked up their supply of all those silver paddle tip reflectors. I pulled out I think it was uh, upwards of thirty boxes that they had in supply. And we forward all of those to the uh, Auxiliary National Supply Ch uh, Center. Someone ran some numbers, and and I think the the, um, the, um, the numbers that they ran is like if you're hitting a, a million new paddle sport or paddlers every year, the sixty thousand uh, paddle craft stickers or paddle tip stickers doesn't even touch or a, a, a tiny bit of that. So getting out there and having this discussion with, with paddlers is, is of vital importance. Um, the bottom left-hand corner, you can see that um, it, it says right on there that canoe, kayak, and sup fatalities is, is also increasing. And this is reflected because of the increase in paddle sports, uh, uh, paddlers um, uh, going on the water. Uh, the, the bottom right-hand corner, it was the numbers from 2022 and you can actually see that um, the total of uh, deaths for paddlecraft were, were 149 deaths in 2022. The only other category that uh, outpaced that was open motorboats. So we're, we're a big segment of the market, folks. And so what do we do? Um, the Form 7012A 
um, helps us as vessel examiners uh, run through this exercise. And it's a discussion that we're having with uh, uh, with uh, paddlers, uh, whether it be stand up paddlers, uh, kayakers in all their forms, uh, even even rowboats and, and skulls. We can have this discussion and, and, and talk to them about some of the things of they should be aware of or, or should know. Uh, some of the rec uh, requirements that sh they should be abiding by and some of the recommendations that they should follow. Uh, we should be able to hold these uh, vessel safety checks um, and uh, uh, regularly. Um, you you'll have them at launches, retail stores, uh, rental facilities, things of that nature. But there's nothing from stopping us from having them at um, neighborhood pools. I actually have a, a couple of neighborhoods that they've invited the auxiliary and the division 25 strike force is what we call ourselves. And we do demonstrations and we, uh, for them and from rescuing and paddling. So we're in their pool showing them these rescue techniques and just having a public affairs table of that. Um, I've advocated doing on the, um, what is it? The neighborhood nights out in, in August, uh, nothing, for, uh, nothing says we can't set up a table in our neighborhood or even, um, Let's have a, um, a, a eclipse watch. Why can't we set up a public affairs table in your neighborhood and, and talk a little bit about uh, public uh, paddlecraft safety at those events as well? So moving along to the vessel safety check, why is this important? Well, this is important because um, when you step through 7012A, one of the first things you talk about in the op owner operator box is whether or not they've attended a, a safe boating class or some type of skill, you would be surprised how many folks go directly from uh, Walmart, Dick's Sporting Goods, uh, Costco, uh, Tractor Supply, and they take their kayak, they take their um, life jacket, and if they have the paddle, they take that and they go down to the water. They don't have a clue what they're getting into, but they figure they can do it. So having that first discussion with them about well, maybe you should take a class. Maybe you should, maybe you should um, <clears throat> do it online. In the upper right-hand corner, you can see that the American Canoe Association has an online course that you can walk through and and get a firsthand um, uh, understanding of what 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 you should know uh, when, before you go out on the water. So, a lot of the folks that I've bumped into um, on the on the ramp in neighborhoods, um, they don't know nav rules. <laughs> They don't know what the navigation markers are. They don't know what are, are required equipment and recommended equipment. So it's it's an education that's just got to get started. And this is important because paddle pa um, power boats, they're required to, to go to a class. They're required to, to, to sit in and, and, and pass that, that class in a classroom facility. But paddlers, they don't have to have anything to indicate that they are even slightly aware of what of getting of getting on the water in a safe fashion so so um, the first section the owner operator information is a great opportunity to open the door and have that discussion about safety classes um paddle craft information in section two you start talking about the craft that they bring down to the water or the, the craft that they're going to be renting um how long have they been paddling it can you tell me a little bit about why you selected that craft as opposed to any other craft? Can you tell me a little bit about um, this craft that you have, whether it's a sit inside or a sit on top and whether it's the appropriate for this body of water, uh, whether it's appropriate for, um, for, the, for the, where you're gonna be traveling down the river. Um, you'd be surprised. And I started off, uh, I came to the auxiliary as a, a powerboat bass fisherman. I tra uh, uh, converted over to a, um, pa uh, uh, a paddle craft fisherman, a kayak fisherman, and now I'm exclusively a kayaker. But I talk to uh, kayak fishermen and I always remind them that they are a kayaker first. They've got to know their boat. They've got to understand its behavior and what they're doing out there with it before they even get their, their, their hook wet in the water. So that's some conversation that you, you should have with these with these folks when they're getting onto the water. Um, moving right along about the uh, safety check requirements and, and what is required. And, and a lot of folks don't realize that 
they are to have a, a whistle when they go on the water. When they're when they're uh, any vessel should have a a life jacket first first of all, but then they should have a whistle or a horn. Whistle's great because you can tie it off or attach it to your life jacket. Um, I've done I've done two livery um, uh, inspections already this year, and my group and I we looked over at all the life jackets, and we were so happy because the rental facility, every single one of them had a whistle attached to it, uh, and because we advocated, we told them get whistles, and here's why. So having that conversation and telling folks here's a whistle. Now what do you do with the whistle? Um, what's the sound that you should make? Matter of fact. What's the sound that the boat's going to make if if he's trying to communicate, he or she is trying to communicate to you? So those are just some important conversations to have with the paddlecraft and, and why they should take a class and be a little bit more aware. The first thing, first and foremost, of course, is having a life jacket. Not only having a life jacket, but wearing a life jacket. Um, on the screen, you see all the various types that you have. Upper left-hand corner, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's freer movement, you know, it's, it's less chaffing, it's built for paddling. The upper right hand corner, it has all these pockets for fishing. The child's um, uh, vest in the lower left hand corner. Um, in the bottom middle, you ask all these questions. Um, and the reason why you ask, well, is your life jacket comfortable? Because folks won't wear it if it's not comfortable. They'll take it off, it's too bulky, it's not, it gets in the way, all these things. But when you put it on, does it fit? Do you know how to make it fit? Do, do you know how to tighten it in such an order? Um, there again, in the, in the middle picture, you have the whistle. Do you have the whistle attached and, 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 and readily available or instantly available for you? The bottom right-hand corner, we talk about inflatables. And, and the yellow inflatable is actually a fanny pack inflatable. It's not actually a fanny pack. I get upset when people tell me it's a fanny pack for a sup. Stand up paddler, the proper way to wear it is around your belly button. You see all the sup paddlers with it in their back. And if that were to go off, they have no way of bringing it around, putting the horseshoe over their neck. They haven't gone through that exercise. They haven't gone through that motion. So they're not aware of it. Um, and so we talk about inflatables and where they should be and how they should be worn. Last but not least, everyone talks about uh, is the question about the color. Why is the color important? Because when I tell people a bright color, whether it's red or orange or yellow, when I tell paddlers, when they want to be out the, on the water, I tell them to wear bright colors. The object is to be seen. To, when you go paddling, you want to be seen, but paddle as if you're unseen. In other words, that person doesn't see you, stick to the shoreline, stay away from the center of the channel, and it just goes on with the conversation. So that's my spiel for the first segment, just talking over the legal requirements. Um, I, I think, Roland, you wanted to just see if anybody had any questions or comments at this point in the game? Yeah. Uh, does anybody have any uh, any questions they'd like to raise or uh, or comments? Uh, Rollin, uh, Dave Fuller, uh, jumping in here. I just wanted to say, first of all, thank you all for doing this. It's terrific. For those of you that aren't aware, uh, I'm the director of education for the auxiliary, and we partnered up with the fee directorate uh, to put together a paddler's guide to safety. And if your folks in your flotilla aren't using that, I urge you strongly to get that uh, going in your flotilla. But what I wanted to talk about here real briefly, Rollin, yep. is... From NASBA, uh, I know we use all these acronyms. NASBA stands for the National Association of State Boating Law Administrators. And uh, I get a weekly uh, news update from them in my email each week. They had an article today about three uh, kayakers uh, that were found over the weekend uh, in a Missouri lake. And uh, I think it's Lake Stockton, if anybody knows where that is. Uh, an 18 year old girl and two uh, two other guys and they fell out of their kayaks. None of the three of them were wearing life jackets. Uh, three needless deaths. If they'd have been in life jackets, it would have been a whole it would it would have been a non story. So you talk about why the importance of this. That story right there just drives it home with a 
hitting the nail right on top of the head. And I just yep. I just wanted to share that with a group tonight. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Uh, hey, Roland. Yeah. Uh, two things. Yep. One, uh, Joey, nice job. Uh, actually, I give advice to uh, to people that come up to me and say, hey, I'm thinking about getting a kayak. Um, you know, give me some advice. I said, yeah. I said, the same thing you said about life jackets, I say about yes. color of Paul. Camera's off. Uh, you know, red, you yellow, in. orange, you want to be you want to be seen. Uh, the second thing is, and you mentioned you you made a reference to the nav rules. Under the nav rules, a kayaker has no priority over any other vessel. And I talk to kayakers about that all the time, and they're almost always floored with that piece of information. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I I like to explain the rule of gross tonnage, that. Uh... <laughs> it's it's not really even about the rules it's about uh protecting yourself and uh you know realizing you, you may not be seen and you're probably more maneuverable than just about everything else out there on the water um uh, we had a couple of uh, comments in the uh in the chat box uh mike andrews pointed out that uh uh life jackets are especially important for inflatables uh if you know if you're if you're inflatable loses its inflation, you might be in a lot of trouble. And uh, Michelle Stoddard, uh, when Joy was talking about the different uh, different kinds of kayaks, was uh, making the point that uh, you really have to think about kind of the, the size of the paddler and the size of the kayak, get, getting a good fit and and the right uh, the right size kayak for the paddler. Hey Ron, this is uh, Tom Niles. I uh, just wanted to uh, say, uh, Joe, to say to Joey, great job, Joey. You did a very, very nice job. Good to see you again. Uh, I did want to uh, ask if I, I know it's not, and so I'm the deputy director of uh, vessel exams, but uh, this is kind of in Dave's lane more than it's in my lane. Uh, Dave Fuller, that is. Uh, so I know the auxiliary does have a paddler's uh, course paddler education course it's maybe not as accessible as the online ACA course but I'm wondering since this is the Coast Guard Auxiliary that we might want to include that in your discussion about you potential learn. education opportunities yeah as you know, just kind good. of how about you yeah so yeah I think one of the uh, we uh, went to uh hey, I'm sorry I'm MWM you're uh you're yeah, not unmuted. I'm on a Zoom thing with Coast Guard. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and mute them. Oh, uh, there we go. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that uh, we haven't got our proposal together yet, but we're going to try to uh, to do a number of uh, pedal craft related presentations at uh, NACON. And uh, I think that would be a, a really good element to have is to give uh, teach some instructors how to teach that course. Uh, so I think we have, we have a good deck, and I think we need to uh, to get it out there and use it more. I don't think yeah, it's, absolutely. it's not offered very much right now. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to uh, hand it over to uh, Don Rice, our uh, our uh, our 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 member down in uh, Naples, Florida, and he's going to talk about kind of the nitty gritty of uh, actually doing the exam. Okay, thank you, Roland. Uh, Joey, next slide. Okay, there you go. So you saw a few kayaks in the previous slide that Joey had. One was a, a fishing kayak and another was a sit on top, similar to the sit on top at the upper right corner in this slide. Um, and then the far left upper slide, you see three different types of sit inside kayaks. And then on the bottom, those are whitewater kayaks that are also sit inside kayaks. And then the far right lower is a canoeist going down um, a river, whitewater. And I just want to point out if there's a piece of gear that that canoeist uh, should be wearing. And I, I, I hope that when you talk to somebody that does that sort of um, paddling that they would wear helmets. Uh, anytime you're in white water, you should have a helmet on. And that's something that 
isn't even on a 7012A, but it certainly should be for anybody that's dealing with those kinds of conditions. Um, so one of the things I want to point out here are some of the differences in these uh, paddle craft. The, and the sit on top is very obviously different than the sit inside. Um, when you get inside a kayak, your legs are concealed inside that cockpit. Some of the co some of the kayaks have bulkheads inside, like the longer one at the top, the yellow on the far left. Um, that one has a bulkhead set in a four and a half separating the hatches. Uh, those hatches are what um, provide flotation for that particular type of boat. A lot of these boats need flotation added. They don't come with flotation. The sit on top doesn't need flotation because it's inherent to the design of the craft. Uh, there's an air pocket completely around um, the, the boat itself. And so it, it uh, and it has a scupper hole in in the base of it, which will self drain the water once the water comes in. So the likelihood of sinking a sit on top is pretty pretty rare, unless you puncture a hole in it and it actually water gets inside that chamber. Whereas with a sit inside kayak, if you don't have a sealed compartment like the fore and aft hatches that provide flotation, once those boats get full of water. There's nothing to keep them from sinking other than putting airbags inside that will displace water and provide flotation. And that's what most whitewater paddlers do. The boats on the bottom left corner, those are whitewater boats. They usually will have um, airbags uh, fore and aft to provide flotation should uh, the boat capsize and fill up with water. The red and blue in the upper left corner also needs um, airbags, at least in the forward part of the boat. The one of the, the blue one in the middle looks like it might have a hatch in the back, which means it probably has a bulkhead um, separating the seat and that back hatch. But um, airbags are something that um, we need to be aware of and talk to people about their purpose in any kind of boat that does not have a concealed compartment. Recreational kayaks have absolutely no purpose of being out in open water. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about next is the different types of locations where uh, people would be paddling. Uh, so next slide. So there's three different areas that are uh, noted on the 7012A. And the first is the protected water. Protected water means that it's sheltered water and it presents no special hazards. And that's water such as rivers, harbors, lakes, bays, canals, creeks, um, where you could easily get to shore if you had to swim. If the boat were to capsize, and even if it did fill up with water, you would be able to get to safety uh, within a reasonable amount of swim. A reasonable amount of swim. Uh, 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 whoever saw talking, could you mute? Yeah, thank you. I've got that. So the, the open water. Um, is where most of us sea kayakers spend our time. And that's an expanse of an ocean sea, large lake, which is distant from shore. And it is not an area that you would uh, want to swim to shore should your boat capsize. Um, so you need to resort to other uh, tactics. That is, be able to get back in your boat by yourself or with assistance. Swift water, on the other hand, is water that is moving, just like that a slide, uh, that picture where the canoeist was going down the river. That is swift water, otherwise known as white water. Um, swift water is typically found in hills, mountain areas, or in flash flood areas that is designed or are designed for moving water away from and uh, represents water in a natural setting going downhill. <clears throat> Okay, so these are different types of water uses and different types of craft would be used in those different types of water. Like I said earlier, that whitewater kayak is designed for swift, swift water. Thus, the uh, sit on top recreational kayak is designed for protected water. And the sea kayak, like you see in this slide, are designed for open water. Uh, <clears throat> 
One of the things that we often uh, get asked to uh, do a vessel safety check on is a paddle board. The paddle boarders are not required to have a, an ankle leash, but they should. An ankle leash uh, is a Velcro strap that goes around the ankle and then it attaches to the board uh, with Velcro also. There's a little pin in the back side of the board, which uh, the ankle leash will attach to. So if the paddler were to fall off the board, it would still be attached to the to the board. Um, and, and so in wind, quite often those boards, especially if they're inflatables and the inflatables also have the little pin that you can attach the ankle leash to, they can get away faster than you can swim. And um, it's very, very important, I think, as we um, try to educate paddle boarders the necessity of wearing an ankle leash. They they come coiled or straight. I, I prefer the coiled because it's um, less likely to get tangled up um, in, with your feet. Okay, next slide. So when you're looking at boats, um, the, the hull needs to be checked. And um, if there are any cracks or obvious uh, areas where leakage could, or water could leak into the cockpit, uh, that boat should not be approved um, for use. Um, they can be patched, whether it's uh, plastic or fiberglass or any other material, there's means of uh, getting those repaired. And that should be a recommendation that you give to its owner. Um, the other thing that you want to look for is to make sure that the hatches are watertight. The hatches are the flotation for a sea kayak. If they're not watertight, they're not serving their purpose. And there's a couple ways that you can check for that, depending on the type that it is. The type that you see in, in this picture uh, below the yellow uh, boat has um, a hatch cover that that yellow plastic piece with the straps over it on the left uh, side of the picture. Those straps hold that cover um, in place. The actual watertight piece is the picture that you see to the right. And that's a neoprene um, cover and it's stretchy. So it, it has a tendency to wear out around the edges especially on um, boats that have very sharp hatch um, placement where the, the hatch cover sits on it. So you wanna hold that up and look through it, make sure that there's no daylight that you can see, or sometimes even just um, if you stretch it out, you can start to see where the neoprene will start to deteriorate and break apart. That's very, very important that you make that check. There's another type of hatch cover, and that's the rubber type. This is a type that you'll see on a lot of different kayaks. And they usually come with a tether that you can uh, attach to the inside of that hatch. And it's very important that you check uh, to, you know, and at least educate the boat owner about the necessity of attaching that uh, hatch cover to the boat with a tether. Um, and, and you can make shift that uh, or suggest that the owner make shift that so that the hatch cover doesn't end up on the side of the road somewhere uh, at high speeds, which um, this boat owner has experienced. <laughs> Next slide. So bungee cords and deck lines are two very different types of lines on a kayak. The, um, the red arrows indicate the deck lines. And you can see the paddler holding on to the deck line up in the front part of that kayak. And then the, the arrow to the left uh, and bottom part uh, where the deck line extends all the way back to that, uh, that grommet. Those deck lines are what enable um, a kayaker to get back in, in his boat. It also is very useful if, if that kayaker needed assistance and somebody had to hold on to his boat for him while he was getting back into the boat. So it's very, very important. You cannot conduct a satisfactory rescue without deck lines. Um, there's just nothing to hold on to. The boat will just be turned right over and slip right out of your hands. 
those deck lines are absolutely essential when open water use of any paddler that and that paddler should be aware of its of the purpose of those deck lines as well as to make sure that there's enough room between the deck line and the the, the boat to get your hand underneath it sometimes the deck lines are so tight that you can't even get your finger underneath there well they're useless in that case if you cannot hold on to the deck line and pull yourself up by holding on to that deck line, it's not serving its purpose. The bungee cords are useful for storing gear on the, um, the bow of the boat. You can see a paddle float, a water bottle, and a bilge pump being stored under the bungee cords on this particular boat. You wanna make sure that the bungee cords are um, useful and, and that they're not frayed and ready to, to break. Sometimes the outer um, layer on the bungee cord will either get um, rotted by uh, salt water or excessive sun. And so you wanna make sure that it's not gonna snap or break, um, otherwise you end up losing your gear. Most of us uh, use the bow to store gear and the, the back deck is usually kept free uh, for con conducting rescues or doing other types of uh, maneuvers. Especially if you like to roll, you need that back deck free, right, Roland? Yep. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. So there's a lot of different types of hardware in boats. Um, some of us uh, prefer not to have any hardware in our boats because hardware has a tendency to break down and um, needs continuous maintenance as well as replacement, especially rudders and rudder cables. Um, the, the, the cables are braided um, line and they have a tendency to fray, snap, break, corrode and need replacement. Um, if you have a boat with a rudder and you don't carry a spare rudder cable, you're asking for trouble, I think. Um, inside the boat, you have foot pegs. Um, you also have skegs uh, that are used in place of a rudder. A skeg does not turn the boat it simply stabilizes the rear of the boat from weather cocking. So it's very, very important that um, if the boat is being used in salt water, that you inform the owner that they need to clean it regularly after each use, inside out, especially where there's metal parts, uh, to make sure they get all the salt water out of the boat and um, keep the parts uh, clean. Next slide. So bulkheads, as I mentioned earlier, bulkheads are important for flotation. Um, and the picture on the right, you can see that white um, plastic uh, piece there, that is a bulkhead. That separates that um, from the bulkhead all the way to the stern of the boat. That space is where the flotation for that particular part of the boat comes in. And there would be a similar uh, type of bulkhead in the bow of the boat as well. Those two bulkheads are where the flotation comes from. The picture on the upper left, that individual does not have an airbag in his boat, and that's why the boat is sinking, uh, because it does not have any flotation other than the rear part of the, uh, the boat, where you can see um, the hatch cover on the back end of that boat. So what he needs to do is put an airbag in the bow of that boat to displace some of that water that's filling up inside the boat. And then he would be able to successfully um, keep that boat afloat, even if, it, even if the cockpit did fill up with water. The individual on the bottom right is also experiencing a similar problem with cockpit filling up with excessive water and the need for um, some type of flotation in the rear of that boat. So the, the airbags, that they look like uh, the upper far right corner, those airbags are critical, and, and you can get them designed in all different sizes and shapes. Canoeists um, use them to fill up the space on their open canoe when they're uh, using a canoe in white water. They come for, uh, whitewater boats have different sizes, depending on the type of boat it is and how much displacement you're uh, needing for that particular boat. 
Uh, one of the things that might be useful is to have one of these in your toolkit as a vessel examiner when you conduct a vessel examination, especially if you see a boat that does not have bulkheads and uh, lacks any kind of flotation, you can uh, demonstrate the, the purpose of the airbags and suggest that that owner gets them. Okay, in the bottom right corner, you see the person using a, a paddle float. The, the paddle float is inflated and it goes on the end of the paddle. And that is uh, the means of supporting yourself to get back into the boat. There's also a different type. And this, this is a large foam block that serves the same purpose where the paddle goes inside um, the opening of these this block. However, this takes up a lot of space on the boat and is not desirable for anybody who is trying to economize on the, the deck of their boat. So we tend to use the, the paddle float because it deflates and you can roll it up and it takes up very minimal uh, space on the boat. Okay, next. So the paddles uh, come in all different sizes, shapes, forms, and efficiency, and as well as costs. Uh, you can get a heavy duty fiberglass paddle or you can get a carbon fiber paddle. And the price varies uh, quite a bit. The, it's important, I think, that when you're conducting a vessel um, safety check that you ask to see the paddle and you look at it closely. Um, the ferrule, the ferrule on the paddle um, has, in some cases, numbers on it that indicate that you can feather the paddle. So when you uh, put the two pieces together, you'll have one blade at a different angle than the other blade. And the advantage of doing that is that if you are paddling in strong winds, the upper blade would slice through the wind and the lower blade would propel the boat and then vice versa when you change hands. Um, so there's there's an advantage to using a, a, a paddle that can be feathered if that's a uh, paddler's choice. A Greenland style paddle typically is not feathered, they're just straight. And um, the Greenland style paddle that you see the, in the lower part there, the Greenland style paddle is um, a lot less stress on shoulders as, um, as we tend to get older, our shoulders tend to talk to us a little bit. I have resorted to using a Greenland paddle for that reason. It's very uh, less stressful than, than a Euroblade. However, a Euroblade is much more maneuverable. And if you're doing any kind of um, um, tunnel activity or anything that requires a lot of um, bow rudders or different kinds of maneuvers, uh, the Euroblade is... Uh, my preference. Let's see. The ferrule on the on the uh, paddle should be looked at, and you should talk to the owner about keeping that clean. Alcohol wipes are really good, especially if um, you're paddling in salt water, or if there's any um, sand nearby that gets in that uh, area between the the two pieces of the shaft. That needs to be cleaned out very very carefully. Otherwise the sand will eat away at the ferrule and eventually the paddle will be so sloppy that um, you, you won't even enjoy the, the paddling experience because the two shafts will be rubbing against each other or bouncing off each other. If that's the case, then you should recommend that that person replace the paddle. The, the blades should not be cracked. Um, chips, you know, are okay. Um, it, it's hard not to chip them if you paddle around rocks or oysters or uh, they often do get chipped off, but um, they shouldn't be cracked. The shaft shouldn't be bent or cracked. Um, uh, and so if it is, you should suggest that the owner uh, replace those. Okay, next. Oh, reflectors. Can you go back? So you saw that reflector on there. Those reflectors like we were talking about earlier are um, very, very important, I think. 
And I don't think we can get enough of them out there. You know, every paddle should have one um, on it. And and so I, I'm looking forward to uh, being able to start handing those out here pretty soon. Um, okay, lights, next. So um, a flashlight or headlamp or some kind of light, if you're paddling at night, um, I use a Lucy light. And a Lucy light is... Um, Solar, solar powered, and it's, so it's got 360 degree light, um, and it, I mean, it, this is a, one of the coolest things ever. It's even got a strobe on it, so, so it's, you know, solar powered. You can't beat that, right? No batteries, um, uh, reflectors. Um, I have reflective tape on my boat. Uh, I have reflective tape on my PFD. I have reflectors on my paddles. Um, I don't think you can put enough reflector material uh, when you're out there, especially if you're paddling around uh, where there might be boats at night. Okay, next. So in 2012, uh, canoes, kayaks, and other paddle craft, uh, manually propelled boats are no longer required to carry a visual distress signal. However, I think we should suggest to our boater friends that they carry some kind of device, whether it's a strobe, a flag, that uh, maybe Joey's going to go into business with those power flags that he created. Um, I carry a lot of glow sticks. The glow sticks are are just, you know, they're cheap, they're effective, they work. And, um, you know, for nighttime paddling, they don't uh, ruin your night vision. I uh, tack one on the back of my PFD so fellow paddlers can uh, see us. I often put one um, at the launch ramp so I can see it when we're coming back, uh, especially if it's it's not lit up, which often where I launch at night is. And so I just hang one in a tree or nearby on a post so I can see it and know exactly where to go at night. Um, the glow sticks are, are, you know, I think they're priced, you know, they're, Definitely something that you should consider having. Um, we're supposed to have three distress signals if we uh, travel at night. I carry flares if I'm on a longer trip. Um, I've never had to use them, but I have them anyways. Okay, next. So now we get to the open water recommendations. These are the folks that are in sea kayaks that are going out for longer trips in open water um, that's away from barrier islands that's away from any possibility of being able to swim to shore should you fall out of your boat so it's important then for those type of paddlers that they know how to get back in their boat either uh, unassisted or assisted the paddler in the bottom right slide is getting back into his boat uh, unassisted using the paddle float That cannot be practiced enough. And it should be something that um, when you talk to boaters, whether they're new or experienced, um, that they practice. Uh, and one of the things that uh, Roland is going to talk about is, is belonging to a kayak club. The, the club I belong to, we practice regularly. And uh, a lot of times, once a week almost. And it, you cannot practice that enough because... When we practice, we're not practicing in rough water conditions. But when you capsize, you're not capsizing in a lake. You're usually capsizing in rough water. And the, the skill that it takes to get back in a boat in rough water is a lot different than it is to get back in a boat on a lake. Um, and so if, you, if it becomes muscle memory and you know exactly what to do, it sure makes the task a lot easier. One of the things that's really important though in rough water conditions or open water is to keep water out of the cockpit. When I first came to Florida, I was amazed at how rare I saw people wearing spray skirts. It's hot, they would say, or I don't need one. Yet when I paddled with this one group, uh, somebody fell in the water, nobody had a spray skirt on, nobody could conduct a rescue because it could when you conduct a rescue, you edge your boat, you lean over, 
And if you don't have a spray skirt on, guess what's going to happen? The cockpit's going to fill up with water. So I was the only one around that had a spray skirt on. And so I was busy uh, putting people back in boats who fell out of their boat. It's something that should be talked about and practiced also, just like anything else. If you don't practice wet exits, that is ejecting yourself from the boat with a spray skirt on, it can be very daunting and scary to people that don't, that might feel trapped inside their boat. The spray skirts have a very strong elastic cord around them and the, the uh, tunnel goes around your waist to keep the water out of the cockpit. There's a pull uh, lever on, there it is down at the bottom right corner there, that circle in orange. That pull lever has to be pulled forward and then up to break the seal of the coning. And quite often people that don't practice that are unaware of exactly how to pull on it and they start pulling towards themselves and it gets caught and it's not easily um, removed. So practice uh, wet exits is something that needs to happen to people who are wearing spray skirts. Okay. Other items that should be carried, a spare paddle um, in case the paddle breaks or in case uh, the wind blows it out of your hands and you can't catch it. Um, there's, there's a lot of good reasons to carry a spare paddle. You should have a, a chart, a compass, a GPS, and um, I, I carry my GPS in a dry bag because even though it says it's waterproof, it's not salt waterproof. And the contacts are uh, for the batteries often get um, salt air in there and, and they'll corrode. Um, I've had to replace this GPS before. I decided it was very critical to keep it in a dry bag. Now I never take it out of the dry bag when I'm using it. No, and we have to uh, we have to get moving here because we're uh, we're getting up on the hour. Okay. Um, all right. So the other item that needs to be carried um, is a a tow belt, and the tow belt needs to have a quick release on it. Um, I carry a contact tow, which is a a very short tow that um, I keep in my PFD. It's about three feet long at line with two carabiners on it. Um, the other thing that I would suggest that you do is take a towing class and learn how to use um, the towing. Next and last slide. So um, marine radios should be carried if you're out in open water. You should have your phone in a dry bag or a dry box. And um, if you're on patrol, you're going to have to have an EPIRB. Um, and um, dry bags are very, very useful. All right, um, and you can see the towing uh, taking place there with the tow line attached to another paddler. And that's, that tow line is around her waist and she's got a quick release so that if something were to happen where she needed to break that tow, she just pulls on the quick release and it, it uh, detaches the belt from her waist. And that's all I have, questions. Okay. Um, uh, let's let's go ahead and uh, and get through this next section. I think uh, uh, Joy, you can go to the next slide, please. I, I think uh, you know, especially what uh, Don was talking about there with the open water recommendations are really things that people are going to use when they take an ACA class. And I our primary target audience is the uh, beginning or novice paddler. And I think uh, those are the folks I think that we've really got to uh, kind of steer towards uh, education and clubs and uh, some of these uh, some of these other places where they can learn. Uh, I really like this uh, pyramid. I think it came from the ACA originally. But basically, we spend a lot of time talking about equipment and the environment. And really, about 75% of the time, what really gets us into trouble is bad judgment. You know, people doing things that 
they probably knew all along they really weren't uh, skilled enough to take on. And one of the most important things we can do is to, to raise these questions and ask people, uh, to ask them some penetrating questions about uh, are, are they are they behaving in a safe way? Uh, next slide, Joey. Uh, I think two of the most important things are paddling with somebody else, uh, ideally in a group, but uh, at least with one other person. Uh, that way, if you capsize, they can help you get back into your kayak. They can they can get help. Uh, it's, it makes a big difference from a safety standpoint. And most most kayakers probably have no idea what a float plan is. And most of them probably don't tell people when to expect them back and, you know, provide all the details that would help uh, uh, the Coast Guard to come find them. So just explaining the basics of what a float plan is, asking do they do something like that, uh, and you know, just just trying to get them to uh, pay attention to some very basic uh, practice like that, I think, is a is a huge uh, step. Next slide. So these are some of the recommendations of things that we can talk about what to wear. One of the most basic things uh, I teach Kitty Hawk kites uh, staff here. They they rent kayaks. They sell kayaks. And uh, they're very athletic young people. They come, you know, most of them are college students. Uh, I tell them all to, to have good foot protection when they show up because there's rocks on the bottom and there's all sorts of places where they can hurt their feet. About one in 10 will show up with some kind of foot protection. <laughs> uh, you know, just common sense here, but really important to have uh, closed toe foot protection. Uh, Bright colors that Joey mentioned, uh, sun protection here on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. That's, uh, uh, you know, cold water is certainly a huge issue, but we were all exposed to heat in the summer as well and uh, and, and sun. And we need to, uh, to really, you know, prepare for that as well. Next slide. Um, we could spend a long time talking about cold water and we do uh, on boat crew. We go out uh, on winter missions here on the Outer Banks. And uh, I think this is a really good conversation to have. And one of the questions that you can ask people is do you, what time of the year do you paddle? What's the water temperature? Do you know what the water temperature is? Have you ever been in cold water? Uh, what do you do to, uh, to prepare for cold water? So I, I think, you know, many of us have got good information to share on that front if, if that conversation is something that's relevant for, uh, for, the, for the people that you're uh, inspecting their kayaks. Next slide, Joey. So uh, this, uh, Don was emphasizing the self-rescue. I think most people, when I talk to them, uh, doing a vessel exam, they say, well, gee, I've never fallen out of my kayak and I'd never expect to. Uh, when you take a class, we tell people they're not, they're not kayakers, they're, uh, or, or they're kayakers between swims is what they are. <laughs> uh, sooner or later, you are going to be capsizing uh, unless you're in the most incredibly calm conditions. My wife, uh, I built her a a kayak we were paddling around in the harbor she decided to come back it was back to the dock and it was uh it was still in the spring the water was cold but she wanted to get back she fell out of the kayak uh getting back onto the dock and she was able to stand up fortunately but uh, uh it can happen anywhere you know and including at the dock so it's uh it's a it's something you really need to practice and really the way to do it's in a class or in a group with a, a paddle club or somebody that really knows what they're doing to uh, to help you learn the uh, the right techniques. There's a lot of different uh, kinds of things that you can bring along and it's, it's hard really to say. Uh, it depends on 
the conditions that you're heading out into, how long you're going to be gone, whether you're uh, close to, uh, you know, to shore and to other people or not. I think uh, communications is one thing a lot of people don't think about. Um, and even if it's just a cell phone, having having some form of communications where you can call for help is uh, is is really important if you're not just right there in the harbor. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, this is me doing something stupid. Uh, uh, I went out for uh, for a paddle. I knew that uh, uh, a storm was coming but I wasn't expecting a water spout and the storm arrived earlier than it was supposed to. Uh, interestingly, uh, I did not see that until I got back and looked at my GoPro uh, film. So, you know, in sports, they talk about having your head on a swivel. Uh, that applies to kayaking as well. You need to be aware of what's going on all around, not just uh, in front of you. Uh, in the lower right of this slide is a is a really nice video that the ACA put out, and uh, I think it's a true story that's reenacted. But it's just a number of things that these two kayakers got into trouble. They go out in the morning, they get into some fog, uh, fog clears up, they get a little disoriented, they end up in uh, in a windy setting, and they end up in the water and. Uh, it was only by luck that they were rescued. And so if you get a chance to to watch that, we've got the link that we can share with you. Uh, I think it's really, uh, it illustrates a number of good things. The importance of communication, uh, dressing for cold water, uh, staying together uh, with your boat and with your, with your other uh, paddler. So uh, some really good uh, information in that video and, and on other things on the ACA site. Next slide. Uh, these are some other resources that uh, we can make available to people. And, and I think one of the most important things here in this, uh, in this section five, this other recommendations is, you know, just learning what kind of paddling people wanna do, uh, what their skills are uh, and, and where, they can, where they can improve those skills. Uh, ACA is really the gold standard. This is an online course here on the top block. Very, it's, you know, cartoons and you can uh, get some basic understanding of some of the risks and uh, and risk mitigation that you can take to, when you go on the water. There's uh, in the lower left, these are, there are a lot of different uh, paddle sports disciplines that uh, ACA teaches. And uh, there's instruction in all of those, including uh, adaptive paddling for for people with uh, disabilities. Uh, another uh, another good place to get instruction is the kayaking 101 classes that uh, last year we offered in uh, North Carolina and Tennessee together with the ACA. Uh, we do that during National Safe Boating Week. In North Carolina this year, we're going to have 15 locations where we're teaching uh, classes of 15. Uh, that includes both on the water and shoreside uh, instruction. Great place to get uh, an introduction to uh, to kayaking and safety. Uh, this year we're going to have seven states that were uh, that we're doing that with the ACA. So really a great uh, a great way to partner with uh, with state parks and with the ACA. Next slide, Joey. So uh, basically, when I get to that last column, you know, that section five, what I'm doing is asking people questions. Uh, and I'm trying to find, like, where the conversation is that's really going to help them. Uh, you know, where do you paddle? You know, if, if it is in totally protected water, maybe that uh, recreational kayak is fine. Uh, if, if they're heading out uh, to the next island, it's not so fine. And they need to think about a different kayak and different skills, uh, maybe some other equipment. Uh, we talked about practicing uh, self-rescues, uh, calling for help, uh, and uh, and really just 
you know, thinking through what the risk factors are in the uh, in the venues and uh, times of year that people might be uh, getting out on the water. Uh, next slide. So we we do have uh, some good resources, and we're in the process of distributing some of these now. The the vessel uh, safety check decal obviously goes with the uh, exam. The if found sticker uh, is uh, is a good way to approach people sometimes. So uh, you know if you can walk up and ask them, uh, do, do they have one of these? Do they know what it is? It's a good way to start the conversation. Uh, the whistle. A lot of people don't have a whistle on their uh, on their life jacket, and we do have whistles now that we're distributing uh, through the uh, National Supply Center and uh, and the paddle reflector kits. So these we don't have as many as we want, but we we have we have I think forty two thousand of each. So uh, we're going to be getting those out there, and I think this is one of the best places to use them. Is when we're talking one on one to. Uh, to the actual paddlers and and not just uh, dropping them off in the library. Next slide. So these are uh, a lot of these resources. I think are are things that uh, we'd like to see vessel examiners familiar with, and I think uh, we need to uh, put a little more time into this, getting some of these things onto. Uh, a sheet, maybe that could be laminated, maybe have uh, QR codes that, uh, you know, if people want to go straight to the ACA site or uh, request a vessel exam, that we've got the links there for them. Uh, there's some really excellent videos out there that, uh, you know, that demonstrate self-rescues and uh, uh, the, the cold water issues and some of those kinds of things. And uh, we're going to be putting some more work into consolidating that into one place where we can uh, uh, send the examiners for resources and and maybe share with also the uh, the the paddler. Next slide. This is uh, these are best practices that the National Association of State Boating Law Administrators, NASBLA, put together, and I think they're excellent. Uh, these are Paddlecraft uh, best practices for liveries and for uh, Paddlecraft retailers. And these are things that uh, I think vessel examiners and program visitors should uh, should be aware of. And we can certainly uh, direct people to these sites, you know, who are operating liveries and who are uh, uh, selling kayaks and other Paddlecraft. Next slide. Um, okay, so uh, let's let's open it up and uh, see what kind of uh, questions people have. Tony had a question. Uh, where does the VE decal attach on the kayak? On the kayak, I I believe it goes on the front uh, uh, port bow. That's where I try to put it. Sometimes if it's uh, Sometimes these kayaks are very low in the water, uh, particularly like for a stand-up paddleboard. You may have to put it on the deck. Any other uh, comments or questions? Hey, Roland, is this uh, going to be on the um, this presentation going to be on the uh, Facebook page? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll link to it from the Facebook page. We have a. Uh, a seminar series for Oxpad that uh, we put all of our presentations up there and we're linking to it from a number of places. We've got a calendar of events and I'm gonna be going back to the past events and making sure that you can link up to it from the calendar. Uh, and uh, if you go to our national website for the uh, B directorate, there's a Paddlecraft uh, division section and a calendar there and and places you can link into our uh, into our videos. You want to update our uh, web page too, Roland? Yeah. So uh, that was uh, Courtney Allen. He's uh, in our local flotilla. He's our our webmaster and web uh, 
graphics guru. Uh, and he's amazing. He gets things up same day. And uh, so we've, we've actually put a lot of these materials up on our local flotilla website and everybody's welcome to, uh, to access those resources as well. And, and we include things there like uh, a lot of it's oriented towards District 5, but we we include a lot of things like uh, the Oxpad Academies and, and things of that sort as well. If you could send me this deck too. Okay. Hey, uh, Roland, this is Mike Hanson. How are you? Hey, Mike. I, uh, this year's uh, the workshop has very little, as you if you've seen it, uh, very little to do with paddlecraft. I, I'd love to get these slide these slide sets, especially the links. Um, sure. To be able to pass out that would be that would be great. Sure, we can we can share that with you. Um, Good job, by the way. Thank you, and thank you for for coming down and inspecting vessels with us last summer and uh, sitting in on these presentations. Well, I, I enjoyed the day. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Um, Joey, why don't you go to the next slide? I think we've got, I think we've got some, uh, some things on here. Um, so these are, I think these are some uh, items that Joey put together that sort of facilitate discussion. Uh, um, does anybody know what the ABC rule is for kayak clothing? Anything but cotton. Absolutely right. So it's uh doesn't dry out very well, and it's doesn't doesn't work very well. What about the one ten one rule? Yeah, you got one minute to get your act together. Ten minutes before you lose muscle control in one hour before you die. Yeah, I think in cold water. water. In cold water, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think you know I I do think the cold water uh, discussion is really important. Uh, we didn't spend a lot of time on it uh, tonight uh, because I figure most of us understand that. But uh, I th I think this this framework for talking about it is really good, and. Uh, you know, I was I I've been out. I was out on the water last night looking at the sunset uh, with a neighbor, and uh, you know we saw people paddling around without life jackets. The water's still still pretty cold, so I think uh, you know cold water is really something we need to be prepared to uh, to talk about. Roland, uh, this is Mike Plavnicki. This was very well put together and extremely informative. So I think with everybody who took the time to put it together some really good stuff here um quite a question i have around that and you just kind of hit that the point about uh personal flotation devices yeah if i understand it correctly um if uh, 83 percent of the deaths in canoes kayaks and so forth are people not wearing life jackets and i think joe you kind of hit you know most important thing i can tell anybody to do is wear the dog on life jacket yep, yep. Um, do you feel our presentation here put enough emphasis on that shock point? I, I think um, I think that's a really good uh, observation. And I think, you know, I think, you know, we, the three of us that are presenting are uh, coastal kayakers. We like to get out on the water, open water, and we spend a lot of time practicing, uh, you know, sea kayaking skills. Uh, and I, I think our target audience really is the novice paddler. You know, these are people that are, most all of them are going to be either on a sit on top kayak or they're going to be in a recreational kayak. And that's, that's right. I mean, we ought to be, I think we should, we should emphasize that more, not just the different kinds of life jackets, but uh, fitting it, wearing it, uh, how to talk about it, you know, how to uh, to make the point with people that uh, how important that is. Uh, and that's, that's, I think, we, we have to keep reminding ourselves who our target audience is. And, and, I, and I, you know, I think, you know, with sea kayaking, I don't see a bunch of sea kayakers out there that are not <laughs> in life jackets. You know? <laughs> These guys already know that, uh, that they need to wear their life jackets. 
Roland, um, I've got uh, a whole nother session of questions for you, but uh, I will, I will, I will mention um, what you to piggyback on what you said about cold water and what Mike said about um, the other aspect of that. When, when we're doing the, at least for us, when we're doing a vessel exam, a talking point it, or, or, or a paddlecraft inspection, and talking to the to to the paddlecrafter. Uh, one of the things that we we find out, okay, they're here on vacation. Where where do they come from? Well, I came from the Colorado River where I'm used to kayak and I'm full blown ACA 1999. Um, and I know what I'm doing and that kind of thing. And, and that's one aspect. But then you have you have the local paddle crafter that we see mostly a, a, as we do regionally. And where are they going on vacation? Oh, yeah, I'm fixing to go vacation in Colorado, for example, or in some white, white, uh, white rapids area. And, yeah. and so we can have a conversation about that. And they may may take us out of our expertise level, but at least we get them to, to think about yeah. uh, you're only a master in the area that you're trained in, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. And I think that, you know, if they're going to go to Colorado, hopefully they're getting out with uh, an organized group or somebody that knows what they're doing. Uh, and hopefully they've had some training. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean that generically. You know? No, but I think I think it's a good point. Uh, and, and down in Florida. Nobody's wearing life jackets and they're going out in the Gulf. And I mean, it's just really laid back. I think the attitudes on this stuff. Uh, no, oh, I agree. Yeah. And, and I, I'll bring this up that I'm a commercial fish inspector as well as a UPV inspector. And I had two inspections actually in a row within two hours apart. And here were the comments where these these fishermen were out at three and five o'clock in the morning and they come across a group of three and five kayakers who may have been on an echo tour or whatever or whatever they were doing. But they came up upon these kayakers at three and four o'clock in the morning. They had n the, the only reason why he caught them on a rare event, which you never see a 26 foot boat with radar, yep. but he had radar. If he wouldn't have had the radar, he would have he would have had contact with those kayakers. Yep. So I just I, I find that interesting. And I just throw that out for discussion and, and future reference that. I was just amazed to think that there's kayakers paddling out there at three and four or five o'clock in the morning. There's, it's quite common here for people to go out fishing at night on kayaks. And they seem to like to fish around the uh, inlets and the channels, like where the boats are, where the power boats are coming. And typically they don't have lights on, you know? So I, I think that it just goes back to that whole conversation. You know, like we say, what kind of paddling do you do? Where do you go? When do you go? Uh, oh, you're going at night. You're fishing. You do you have a light? You know, are you uh, are you doing what you need to do to, to be safe? You know, I think we've we've spoke about best practices here, but can you speak to a moment to where? Uh, I mean, we 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 probably talked about ninety percent of what we talked about is not required for a paddle crafter to to pass their vessel exam. Yep. Can, can you speak to that a little bit? So, yes. Um, so I, I, I think that there's a perception among many vessel examiners that uh, paddlecraft exams aren't very serious because what well, you need a whistle, you need a life jacket, and if you're going out at night, you need a light. Um, you know, so it's, it's like, it's not a real exam. Well, I think the real value is all this other stuff. You know, it's it's the behavioral stuff, uh, the planning, the float plan, uh, as well as you know the bulkheads. Really understanding the, the the characteristics of your kayak or or vessel for the conditions that you're going into, and whether you've got the skills to to go into those conditions. So I think it's I think it's a little bit different. Uh, at the beginning, Joey was saying how. Uh, power boaters have to take a class and very few paddlers have had a class. So that's kind of, that's kind of the deficit that we're kind of address here, you know, to, to talk to people about some of those issues and help educate them and maybe help direct them to uh, where they can get that education. Yeah, that's awesome. Cause in the state of Florida, we're, we're, 
the SLOs and, and, and the uh, LLOs are working on a, a program where if you're under 18, you'll be required to take some type of paddlecraft safety course. And it's more driven for the students and, and going forward. But we're, we're really looking forward to, to, to see the outcome of that. Yeah. But, you know, that's probably four or five years down the road. Uh, I, I did have a question. Don mentioned three distress signals at night. And I, I was a little bit not clear on that. I was just wondering if he could bring that up. Flares. Don? Yeah, flares uh, would be the thing that you're supposed to carry at um, at night so you can have three flares or, um, or or different types of it, it says you must carry a minimum of three visual distress signals night signals include red flares or handheld or aerial so you can have a combination of all those different types like, is, so that's, is that a that's, is that's that a post, that's, law that's a state law that's so for the federal laws for coastal waters, you need to have visual distress signals at night. And the electronic uh, uh, version would work. And really, I think it may be different in Florida, but around here, there's very few people going on uh, on the ocean at night. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think it, it's not required to, to carry... Uh, a visual distress signal during the day uh it's only at night and if if you're on uh basically if you're on the ocean or the hey, Rolls, it's rick yeah. um <clears throat> i'm the division chief for district liaison and uh let me just pass along that right now the state of rhode island has as a regulation is that 365 days a year if you're a paddler you have to be wearing a life jacket yeah that's you know, it's not just for cold water and it's not just for having on board. You have to be wearing it. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing is, is that, uh, and I think you touched upon this a minute ago, that uh, really a vessel exam is not something that is just, it's just a quick look at the boat. Right? The boat really is the means for engaging the operator in a serious conversation about all the aspects of safety. Yeah, and you know, the I, boat's part I, of that, but, but, you know, like the bulkheads, you know, those kinds of things, but that it's really about, like, do you have the right boat? Is, do you want to modify this boat? Those kinds of things. But I had, I advanced that notion to all vessel examiners, not just those doing paddlecraft, that, you know, if you're, if you have the right mentality about this, it's engaging the boater, not necessarily just uh, going through a checklist and slapping a decal on a boat. Yeah. Hey, Roland, one last thing, and I promise I, I'll try to be quiet. Okay, Randy. <laughs> uh, but but I, I've, been a, I've been all consumed with Oxpad uh, over the last several years, and uh, I find it, um, I, I believe it to be the number one recruiting opportunity in the auxiliary, but I'm not going there. But here what I, here's what I did want to say. Uh, I have a colleague on the West Coast in, of Florida who piggybacked with, he got in with uh, FWC, who was actually stopping people from a law enforcement side and doing paddlecraft safety checks. And he stood next to them and listened to the conversation and, and, and does, the, does the vessel exams. Then, then the FWC guy leaves away. And then, he, then, then the vessel examiner has a conversation with the paddlecraft, encompassing ev almost everything that we talk about because he's very knowledgeable. And he 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 let the FWC guy sort of be, do the report writing and uh, was able to have the conversation, engage the the the, the paddlecraft. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are at. Uh... We're 20 minutes past our uh, target time here. Uh, Roland, can I just add one? Sure, John. Sure. One of the things that I, I feel, especially in Florida and places that have a lot of um, tourism, are the outfitters and the liveries. I think that's 
where a lot of our focus needs to be because they're putting people in kayaks without any kind of instruction whatsoever. They don't even require them to put on a life jacket. They don't even know if the life jacket fits, works, or has a whistle. And they're getting away with it because they hire these young high school, young college kids with a pickup truck and a trailer full of boats. And they go to a launch site and they sit there and, and put people in boats and put them out in the water and off they go. Somehow, we, we you know, we, we really need to target that particular group of people and try to educate them to improve their practice in some way. And I'm not sure how we can do that, but, it, you know, because the, the owner is not the one that's putting the people in the boat. The owner is somewhere in Connecticut or New Hampshire, you know, just writing the checks. Um, I, I think it varies, Don. You know, I, I, yeah. I've seen that in Florida and I know it's quite common. Right. And I think it was almost like a halfway house uh, yes. kind of job that people were were working right. I mean, those liveries. But yeah. uh, I, people, I, think, I mean, we've got some we have some liveries that are very serious about it. Yeah. Yeah. And there are some here, too. But, you know, the ones that, um, you know, are, are putting people in uh, without life jackets, those are the ones I think that are setting bad examples for the individual who goes out there. Well, he's not wearing a life jacket. Why should I? Yep. You know, and so we, as a club, we try to model wearing life jackets, paddling together, you know, doing all the right things, but we're outnumbered in some places. I um, think when you talk to a livery, that's, that's a really important topic is, yeah. do you have, do you have life jackets that fit everybody? Right. That can be adjusted, you know, are they all like extra larges, like, and then like, you know, that's all you have. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think you know, you're probably not for the most part going to be able to do like a one day class with all those people that are working at delivery, but you can talk about things like that. I think, and it's pretty high gain. I, 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 I admire the work that was done in Rhode Island to get legislation to mandate uh, wearing life jackets. I, I suspect Florida will be the last of the 50 to, to get on board. Well, I, Don, to your point real quick, I'm fixing to put 127 stickers on uh, kayaks and paddlecraft. They all have HIN numbers. I have the colors and the whole thing. They have all the life jackets and they have all the fit. To your point, how do you have a conversation with the person who's renting that? Right. And and you just brought sparked an idea for me anyway. Is do we create a little pamphlet because the 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 the, the uh, delivery owner is not going to sit there and allow you to give a class to somebody before they get in the water and so on and so forth. We all know that. But hey, Rod, give Rodney, them a little cue card. Rod, Rodney, I have a uh, I have a PV contact. What they have is a mandatory video that if you're going to rent a kayak from them yeah. or, or for that matter, a canoe or a stand up paddleboard, yeah, you have, have to, watch to you have to watch the video yeah. and you have to sign the release and you're issued, a, you're fitted with an issued a life jacket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's, awesome. some, there, there's some places on the West coast, the other West coast that actually uh, do that. Uh, the left coast. Yeah. Uh, Washington and, <laughs> But or, but but you're right. I mean, yeah, you you go to these delivery stations and and we and we do twenty, thirty, ten, twelve, a hundred yeah. uh, vessel exams, and they have all the life jackets that meet the requirements. They have the whistle. They have the flashlight if they're going out at night. And most of the liveries are not going out after night, so that's really not an issue. Uh, and, and we provide them with a vessel safety sticker, and rightfully so. But uh, our, point, our point is, Richard, to my flag here. That would be if you could get that link out to people uh, with that video. That's that's a great thing. I mean, to uh, potentially present as part of the discussions. Yeah. Mike, let yeah. me. Mike, let me see if I can. Uh, I can run that down, and I'll share it through Roland. We have yeah. a very scary situation up here in New York because we are in the to the path of totality for the eclipse coming up. There yes. is a local. Um, rental shop in Buffalo that is charging hundreds of dollars for people to rent kayaks to go out on Lake Ontario 
and uh, paddled God. to see the eclipse. <laughs> the water temperature right now of Lake Ontario is hovering at about 40 degrees and air temperature is about to be only 50 degrees. I, I don't even want to imagine what's going to what's going to occur because of the situation that they that they're putting people in. You're you're absolutely right, Michelle. And I just chime in because in Arkansas in central Arkansas is the uh, the epicenter, if you will. And the yep. state of Arkansas will multiply their population by two point seven times. Uh, which which is enormous, and then it comes all the way up into your arena and so forth. There are many. Uh, I hope that as auxiliaries that we're taking advantage of this opportunity to 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 help uh, prevent, you know, be America's lifesavers uh, because this this thing which is coming up, what uh, April eighth, is April, humongous yep. for all of us. Yeah. It, uh, we've got a hundred, just over a hundred auxiliaries that are being stationed at marinas, boat launches, uh, things like that to just give safety tips out. Say, look, you, you know, if you're going, being obviously a paddler, if you're going out in the cold water, um, if you don't have a dry suit, I would not recommend even going out. Right. And this is the, to my point about the conversation about doing a paddlecraft inspection in Florida. Oh, yeah, I'm going to go up and see the uh, the eclipse in, in New York. Well, so that's where you start having that cold water conversation, which yeah. Roland was alluding to earlier. No. Yeah. So several of our towns around here, there's already states of emergencies pretty much in all of New York state. And um it, they're expecting in one small village in Rochester, New York, an extra two and a half million people coming into the city. Right. And another conversation you can have uh, is that that the state police and in, in, in all of these arenas that are, are, are affected by this have said, plan on taking extra water, extra food, extra this. And plan on six to seven hours on the highway after you get off your paddle craft. Yep. So that's a talking point. Yep. Well, um, I want to thank everybody for coming out for uh, for paddle craft safety tonight. Uh, I think we got a lot of good feedback, and that's really what we were looking for. Uh, I think we we can make some good improvements here. I think. Uh, you know, really, really worthwhile, the comments that you've shared with us. So uh, thanks a lot. Hey, thank Roland, the former, is, Roland, as a former uh, university professor, I can tell you it's a very positive thing when you can't get your group to disengage. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it as a, as a good thing. And they're not even a captive audience. That's right. right. We did lose a few. 